had an encounter where I met someone who would go on to change my life. I guess we've all had that happen. Maybe not in the moment you knew what was taking place. But uh, as we dive into the scriptures, I'm going to tell you a little story. I want you to turn to Luke chapter 23, in fact. You're going to see that in Luke 23, 24. And I just want to say this. Um, up early here, I got a message for our entire church family today. We had an incredible time out uh, at the sunrise service. And we're going to worship the Lord together today. Thank you for coming to this service, making room across uh, the morning for others. But we're going to worship God, Carrie and Megan, the crew are going to be up here, and you're going to get to just worship him on this, the greatest day of the calendar for us as believers. So years ago, um, I was uh, uh, graduating from high school. In fact, when I graduated from high school, I was dating this girl that I'd been dating for a year or so in high school. And when, when we graduated, she moved to Houston, Texas, and my heart was broken. Okay, it was a really, really tough time. And she moved away. And I'd never been to Houston before, so uh, a little bit after graduation that summer, I got on a plane to go see her and her family. On the plane, same plane, uh, was my cousin Anne, who was going to visit her best friend, who had moved to Houston some years earlier. Um, when we got off the plane there, I was just wanting to see my girlfriend, so I was, go- I was making a beeline to her, you know, c- there to pick me up. Um, so Anne introduced me to the gal that she was with. And I just kind of, you know, yeah, whatever, buzzed right past her. Little did I know this girl that I was dating, we would stop dating within months. Imagine that, the long distance thing, uh, going off to college, right? And, and the gal that I buzzed past, I would meet again five years later in Charlotte at a wedding, Anne's wedding. I would fall in love with her and we would get married. My wife, Stacy, yeah, thank you very much. We met, is that, honey, is that you? All right, yeah, awesome. Um, We met in Houston airport. I met my wife and I buzzed right past her. How crazy is that? Have you ever had an encounter like that where you've met someone only later to discover how much they would change your life? Again, I guess all of us have had that happen. Have you ever met someone only to realize later that, oh my gosh, like they're famous or something? I've heard some funny stories like that. Maybe you've met someone, watch this, and in the moment you knew that you'd never be the same again. That's happened for some of us. I think all of us have had encounters with Jesus that are like this. You're somewhere on that continuum, that spectrum of faith today. And what I'm going to do here today is help every one of us figure out where we are, And then how to move to the next step. In fact, I'm going to challenge you to go all the way with him. Here's how we're going to break this down. We're going to look at his cross, his tomb, our road, our room. His cross, his tomb, your road, your room. So I want you to look at Luke chapter 23. So all of the synoptic gospels, the different gospels tell us of the story of the crucifixion. And here Luke gives us some detail in it. He's the one who tells us that he's beside two thieves and what goes down there. And then in Luke chapter 23, verses 44 through 46, okay, it says this, it was now about the sixth hour. This is actually noon, by the way. And darkness covered the whole land till the ninth hour, till three o'clock. And it was three o'clock, Good Friday, that he died. It says, while the sun's light failed. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Interesting detail he gives us. And then he cried out, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And he breathed his last. Now John tells us that right before that he said, It is finished. It says he cried out, It is finished. It was all that was necessary for your salvation and mine. It is why the curtain was torn. You might know this curtain, massive curtain, thick, that that separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple chambers or from the rest of everybody, all right? And and the the Holy of Holies is where the, the presence of God resided. That was the location of the presence of God. Only the high priest could go in one time a year, the Day of Atonement. You see, it symbolized our sins separating us from God. Only one man go through these rites of cleansing and all this kind of stuff. One time a year could go in with fear and trembling. They even tied a rope to his ankle so if he died while he was in there, they could pull him out. I mean, literally. Because we could not go into the presence 
of God. So Luke tells us that the curtain was torn from top to bottom is what Matthew 27 says. Not from bottom to top, not from earth to heaven, but look at this. Our salvation has come from heaven to earth. It's not our trying to be good enough, right? It's not, it, some, some have said Christianity is not a religion, but it's a relationship. Maybe you've heard that before. Meaning, it's, it's not our works that get us up to God, but it's God coming down to us in Christ to establish a relationship with us, right? You bring nothing to the table in regard to your salvation except the sin that makes it necessary. That's all you bring. Now, I could say it this way. Everyone here... Everyone on the planet has a relationship with God. You're either, watch this, an unrepentant, unforgiven sinner separated from God for all eternity, or you're an adopted son or daughter because you've received His grace and His free gift, His perfect life, His death on the cross as your own, and His resurrection. To bring new life to you. You're one or the other. But here's my question for you. Have you encountered his cross? Have you truly stood there at his cross? Have you seen him on the cross dying for your sin? Because there you see God's justice, his holiness, his wrath towards sin, and his unconditional love for you. They collide at the cross and redemption is made possible for us. That's what the cross is all about. Have you seen his cross? But watch this. Have you you just stayed there? Does the logic of that make sense? Or maybe you just know Christ died on the cross like a lot of people. It's like a perpetual crucifix. He's not on the cross anymore. The story's not yet over, and the best is yet to come. So his cross, we see him dying for our sin. At his tomb, we see him raised again victorious over sin, death, and the power of sin, even in our lives. So look at chapter 24. We see verses 1 through 12. Uh, the women went to the tomb. Verse, verse 4, the women go to the tomb on resurrection morning. And check this out. They're going to do something for Jesus, not knowing he's already done something for them. Ah, he's, already, he's already done something for them. And they're asked, why do you seek the living among the dead? They could have said, well, we're in a graveyard. We're not looking for anything alive. We're just a bunch, you know, among a bunch of dead people. And then he says, he's not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you, he, said, he says, he already told you this was going to happen. Jesus taught this was going to happen. He prophesied all of this. He knew it was going to happen. Listen, friends, all of history lands on this statement. He is risen He's not here. He is alive. All of Christianity rises or falls on this statement. This is why today, and don't miss this, every Sunday is Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. But it's why today is the day of all days. Because if Christ is risen, everything about your life is, has changed. Everything about your life should change. If he's not alive, he is of no consequence whatsoever. In fact, I could argue we probably wouldn't know anything about him. People say, a lot of people say, well, I'm a Christian because I believe the Bible. We always fight for the Bible. Listen, listen, let me me challenge you here. Yes, believe the Bible, all of it. But we have a Bible because of the resurrection. Think about it. The eyewitnesses wrote about the resurrection. He rose from the dead, and they wrote about what he did then. Right? And all the New Testament is about Christ and the fact that he rose again. He died on the cross and rose again. All of the Old Testament put together with the New Testament, the Bible that we have, we have because of the resurrection. If he's not risen, then let's pack it up. I mean, let's go eat brunch, Easter lunch or something. Because it's all about the resurrection. And I want to ask you, have you seen his tomb? I've literally seen the tomb. I've seen it empty. And I get it. It seems far-fetched because it is hard to believe because watch this. It's happened once. One time a man died, was buried, rose again to never die again. I get it. It takes, watch this, the eyes of faith to believe this. Again, not works, but faith. But here's what I want to do. I want to challenge all the skeptics in the room. 
I want to challenge all of us with this. Unfollow your unbeliefs. You need to unsubscribe to those unbeliefs. You need to, listen, if he's risen, you need to listen to everything Jesus says. Everything. Are you listening to him? Are you in his word? Because his, his words bring life to you. Among dead things, he brings life. And, and I get it. See, see, the resurrection is a horribly inconvenient fact for those who want to dismiss it. And have tried to since the very first day, since Sunday of Easter Sunday morning. Listen, you may not know this. I've studied this a lot. Um, here's what we know about Jesus outside of the Bible. You say, I struggle with the Bible. Okay, I want to challenge you towards the resurrection. Here's what we know. Jesus lived, we know this historically. I'm talking about extra biblical material, we call it, outside of the Bible. We have history that tells us he died on a cross, capital punishment under Pontius Pilate. We know this. I don't need the Bible to tell me that. We know out, uh, outside the Bible that his tomb was empty, and there's a lot of different then challenges as to why it was empty. There's all kinds of debates. We know his tomb was empty. And we know that his followers, outside of the Bible, we know that they claim to have seen him alive. And then the church was birthed. They gathered on Sundays, as we still do two millennia later, worshiping him as Lord, as if he's God. You see, this, this, this whole move that, that, that just goes off a tangent from the Sabbath, Jewish belief, the Messiah coming, bam, and it shifts. You've got to explain that. If you, if you don't believe, if you're a skeptic, you've got to come to grips with those facts. You've got to explain the birth of the church. You've got to explain millions of lives that have been changed and transformed. Billions, I suppose, who are worshiping him even today. You've got to come to grips with that. So, so here's what I'd ask you. Maybe you've seen his cross. You've seen his tomb in this way. It makes logical sense. Okay, we couldn't be good enough. If he's holy, he's perfect God, then we can't be good. Then Christ died and then he rose again and he proven that he was. I get that. Here's where a lot of us are. You've stopped there. You've stopped there. You've buzzed right past it. The one you're looking for and you continue to look. I love what N.T. Wright said. He says this, Easter was when hope in person surprised the whole world by coming forward from the future into the present. I love that. Think about this. Jesus stepped out of the fog of the future into our present, and he says, this is what's coming. I've been there. I've been to the future. I am, I've been to the past. And here's what's coming. You see, his resurrection was not simply about him alone being raised from the dead, but his resurrection sets in motion the renewal and restoration of all things, including you and me. Paul calls him the first fruits of the resurrection, meaning he's the first installment of all that is coming. The resurrection sets it all in motion. He's making all things new, and he's resurrecting you, and he's resurrecting me. That's what he wants to do. So have you seen him on the cross? Have you seen the empty tomb? Have you encountered the resurrection? And I get it. Maybe for some of us, well, he's kind of blurry. But you cannot dismiss the empty tomb as inconsequential. Maybe you have. I want to challenge you. Let's take another step. His cross, his tomb, our road. And then our room. Look at our road. You see in verses 13 through 29, it's what Kelsey read earlier. We encounter him again on Easter afternoon. Watch this. It's a seven-mile walk from Jerusalem to Emmaus. Two men are walking along, and Jesus shows up. He has these random appearances, almost like a bird. He's just floating around, flying around. He shows up, and he's wa they're walking. Why is he on the road to Emmaus? Because they are. He's pursuing them. He's coming after them. Why are they on the road to Emmaus? Well, gives us a clue in verse uh, 17. They look sad. They're downcast. It's a clue as to why they're on Emmaus. They're followers of Jesus. They are done. They're done. He's dead. He's in the tomb. They're heading home. Perhaps, listen, this is where you are today. Maybe you're on the road of disappointment. 
I mean, in a crowd this size, I'm just guessing, maybe, maybe you're going through one of the hardest times of your life. But don't miss this, friends. He is pursuing you. The very fact that you're here is proof that he is pursuing you. You, I mean, we come here for a lot of different reasons. Some of us, it's Easter Sunday. You're here. I hope to see you next week, okay? Maybe a friend invited you. Praise be to God. What a good friend. Maybe a mama drug you here. But the fact that you're here means that he's pursuing you. Don't miss that. You are on the road, and he is on this road with you. But look at what happens here. Here's why they're downcast. Look at what it says in verse 21. But we had hoped that he was the one. We thought he was going to be the one. They're crushed, you see. Their expectations of Messiah were not met. They expected something else. That was their problem. They expect, and and, and no wonder, but they expected someone else. But we do the same. We do the same. We have functional gods that we pursue. We want a savior, so we turn to a political leader. We want a savior, so we turn to a motivating life coach, going to make us all that we're supposed to be. We, want, we, we, get, we get a kind therapist that will just agree with us. That's what we do. We, we want a savvy financial planner that can make my future secure. We, we look for saviors in all the wrong places. You see, he did not meet their expectations. He was not what they wanted. But here's my great challenge for you today. Listen, Jesus is always the savior He's not always the Savior we want, but He's always the Savior we need. So stop begging for the Savior you want and embrace the one you need. He's come to set you free from all your tired idols that will never satisfy. And the very fact you're here today means you're on the road. Praise be to God. He's pursuing you. And again, maybe you're on that road of unmet expectations, a future story that's been crushed. Dreams have been shattered. Your life is not turning out the way you wanted to. I want to, I'm going to, I want to challenge you. That to stop looking in the wrong places. Look at where Jesus goes first. This is interesting. Scripture. Verse 26. It was necessary for him to suffer. If you didn't know this already, he says, How are you guys so foolish? This was going to happen, and now it's been fulfilled. And then it says, here's, what, here's why we kind of chose this passage. I love this. Luke 24, 27, in this year of the Bible here at our church. And beginning at Moses, that would be the Torah, first five books of the Old Testament, and all the prophets throughout the Old Testament, he interpreted to them all in, in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now, for, listen, imagine this. 20 minute per mile walk. This is about a two plus hour, two and a half hour Bible study from Jesus pointing out how all of the scriptures point to him. I mean, Bible geeks like me, I'm going, this is is the greatest thing ever. What did he say? I got a hunch. Genesis 3. He's the promised seed that would take away the curse of sin. He's the one in Deuteronomy 18. A new prophet's going to come like Moses, but a better Moses. He's the greater Moses. Isaiah 7, a virgin will will conceive, have a son, and his name will be called Emmanuel, God with us. Isaiah 53, he's the suffering servant. By his wounds we are healed. And then he says in John 5, he says, if you believe Moses, you believe in me, because Moses wrote about me. He said that straight up to the Pharisees. He said in John 8, before Abraham was, I am. What? Then it says they picked up stones in order to kill him. You know why? They knew exactly what he was saying. He was saying he was God in the flesh. His cross, his tomb, our road. Watch this, our room. On the, they, they, loved, they loved being with him. And so in 14 through 49, they're, on, they're in the room. It says here that, that, uh, that they, they get to Emmaus. They're intrigued by him. And then look at this, verse 30, 31. When he, when he was at the table with them. He took bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And then he vanished from their sight. You want to know what your resurrected body is like? That's legit. Like, we're going to know each other, but bam, bam, I'm out. We're going to play, I don't know, we're going to be like, I'm going to join you. We're going to play like hide and seek. I'm out. Uh, Notice it wasn't just 
uh, on, on his cross where they figured out who he was. It wasn't just at understanding his tomb or, or pondering the tomb empty. It wasn't there. It wasn't even the greatest Bible study you've ever known or heard in your life. It was here, watch this, face to face with Jesus. Knee to knee, toe to toe, eyeball to eyeball, heart to heart with Jesus. It was Jesus who opened their eyes. I mean, all of those things, all of those are legitimate places to find him. But have you found him? Have you seen him? Do you know him personally? Because all of those other things don't matter. And many people believe, yes, I believe in those things. But you've never embraced. Some of you are here today going, I'm not even sure what that means or what that looks like. We want to help you. It's with the eyes of faith. He's in this room, friends, right now. He's in this room. And he is pursuing you. It says, it says we're, we're in our hearts warmed. We're in our hearts stirred when we're with him. We're, we're going to have an opportunity to worship him. Even now, your hearts are, are stirred because of his presence, because of this truth that we know that we know is true. Move past the logic of the cross and the tomb and move down the road to discover him because ultimately it will happen in intimacy. It will happen in a common place. It'll happen around a table. It'll happen on a walk, in a conversation, in a room like this on Easter Sunday morning. It'll happen in the common places we all go. Those moments of fear and anxiety. It'll it'll happen when our lives are falling apart, when depression takes over, when we see there's no hope in a relationship. He's coming at you in a variety of ways. You know, we talk about finding Jesus. He's been finding you for a long time. A long time. He's coming after you. So after Stacy and I met, again, five years later, we went on to get to know each other. We grew in our love for each other. And ultimately, we, by, by an act of faith, we said yes to each other. We got married. So here, here's the thing. It was a process, okay? But... I remember my wedding day. Have you met him? Is there a time in your life where you've said yes? You've seen these guys are never going to be the same. They see him. Have you seen him? With eyes of faith, you can see him today. His cross, his tomb, you're on the road. All of those are legitimate places. But listen, here's my challenge to you. They're all great points to start. Wherever you are, here it is. Go all the way with Him. Go all the way. Give Him your entire life. Until you get to the resurrected Christ, you'll never experience what the resurrection means. Until you embrace it as your own, you'll never know. You'll be living a religious life, even a religious Christian life, with no joy. That is a beatdown. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And whoever believes in me, though he die, shall he yet live. And everyone who, look at this, lives in him and believes in him shall never die. Do you believe this? His question echoes forth in this room today. Do you, do you believe this? And wherever you are in this process, on this continuum, on this road, I, I can tell you, friends, we want to help you desperately want to help you to take your next step. So come with all of your challenges, all your questions. Give Him your life. You say, well, I don't know if I've mustered up enough faith. The faith of a mustard seed. A little faith is all that's necessary. And He starts to reveal Himself. We believe and then we understand. Belief opens up the portal to see the resurrected one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Give him your life. Worship him. Because death has been arrested. Not only on Easter Sunday, it's arrested in your life. He's bringing dead things to life. He wants to resurrect your life. Every relationship, every moment, every fear that you have. He wants to do it in your life today. That's why he brought you here. You're not here by accident. You're on the road, and He is pursuing you. So I want us to pray together. And I want you to receive Christ right now. If you've never received Him, I want you to just bow your head and close your eyes with me right now, wherever you are on that continuum of faith. 
Friend, if you don't know him, by faith, just, just thank him. He, he came. He died on the cross for you. The curtain has been torn so that you can step into the presence of God. Give him your heart right now. Just by faith, say, Jesus, I give you my life. And friends, the, so many of us here, maybe you say, I think I did. I think I met him years ago. But he's not the one I've truly said yes to. Today is your day. Give him your life. Worship him with all you've got. And today on this Easter Sunday, the day of days, we have the opportunity privilege to worship our Savior, to tarry with Him, cross the table, and praise Him. Lord, we love You, and we worship You. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.